Judge Richard Gurley said after 37 years of serving different capacities in the court system, including 16 years as a judge, this is one of the most horrific cases he's ever experienced. On February 27, 2021, the picturesque city of Grand Junction, Colorado, known for its natural beauty and fine wine, was gripped by an unthinkable horror as a teenager's disturbing ideas were transformed into a chilling reality, leaving the community in shock and disbelief. Brian Cohey, a teenager, hid a chilling secret deep within himself, a disturbing fascination with murder in the most brutal way imaginable. When the realization struck that his easiest victim would be a homeless person, there was no turning back for Brian. Months of careful planning had culminated into one of the most disturbing and ruthless cases when he chose to murder Warren Barnes, a 69-year-old homeless man who was loved by the community. However, as Brian's dark plan unfolded, reality came crashing down when his own mother stumbled upon the victim's decapitated head and dismembered limbs in their once ordinary family home. This horrifying discovery swiftly triggered Brian Cohey's arrest and subsequent interrogation. The detectives tasked with unraveling the truth must now understand what truly happened. My name's Pete. I'll, I'll be right back with you. I just didn't know if you needed a drink or... I'd like some water, please. Water? Okay. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, this is Lisa. She's on the show. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. Are you? Okay. So, we haven't met, have we? No. Can you, it's Brian, walk me through, how do you spell your last name? You want my full name or my last name? Your full name. Good. Thomas. Cohey, C-O-H-E-E, -E, Junior or the second, whichever one. I want your birthday, Brian. January 10th, 2002. And how did you get here? I murdered someone. Okay. You want to look at a form with me? I know the basics, very okay. rights. Yeah, that's what it is, but I got to go over a form with you just to make sure we both understand them, okay? Yeah. So, can we go back over, I didn't quite understand the dates or what ended up to the body. You said you tried, but it didn't work out. Um, so let's go back what do you want to know? To start back at the beginning and go slow and tell me as many details as you can remember. So, because I mean, Murray going to jail for the 15 years probably. I have no idea. Because We're at the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's murder. I mean, I'm going to jail for okay. 20 probably, but um, so I figure, well, I fight it. Okay. Um, so what's important to me is to learn as much about you and what you did and as I can. Well, as many details as you can give me, the better. At the start of the interrogation, Brian Cohey surprises the detectives by openly admitting to the murder. It's rare to encounter such a careless, calm, and seemingly nonchalant behavior. The detectives' initial task of getting a confession is already accomplished leaving them with the job of uncovering the motives and details behind the heinous act. I drive a 2007 Ford 500, okay. and I keep a small 18-inch bat in there for self-defense, okay. and a large kitchen knife in the glove box, both for self-defense, because uh, I don't really trust anyone, or really any part of this town. So. That's why I have both. Yeah, it was the night of February 27th. It was a full moon. And I figured, I can see so well, why not drive out? And uh, I am in a bad state of mind at that time. I am, I have major depressive disorder, so I am not thinking, so I think positively. Okay. Brian Cohey's life was that of a loner with few friends, diagnosed with multiple mental illnesses. With diagnoses of major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, autism, and ADHD, one might feel sympathy for his struggles. However, as Cohey reveals the horrifying events of that day, any inclination to pity him fades away. His gruesome confession is enough to turn one's stomach and remove any remaining sympathy for the teenager who was once just an outcast. And I'm cruising around for an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah, was, there was a road underneath, right? Uh-huh. Uh, under the overpass. 
and I was driving along, and I see a shape here on the railway track. So I'm like, oh, interesting. So I go up, and as I'm looking, I see a large thing wrapped in a canvas. Okay. And I'm like, that's a homeless person. So I grab my knife, I put on three layers of gloves, because plastic gloves can betray their users because they're so thin of vinyl gloves mm -hmm. by imprinting your fingerprints through. So I put on two, three on one hand. I took the knife, I pulled back the canvas, and I stabbed his neck. This is him. I was straddled on top of him like this. Okay. And uh, he couldn't fight back. It was actually surprisingly easy. I was barely breaking the sweat. I thought, oh, this guy, he's going to be tough. But no, it was actually surprisingly easy. Brian Coey was driving around in Grand Junction, looking for a victim. As he came across a tent under the bridge on Crosby Avenue occupied by 69-year-old Warren Barnes, a homeless person. His dark impulses fueled the thought of Warren as an easy victim, someone that, according to Brian, nobody would care about if he were to go missing. Since he was young, Brian had a fixation on the idea of murder, influenced by serial killers who portrayed killing as the best feeling one can experience. His first taste with the act of killing occurred a few years prior when he killed a cat near his parents' house, keeping its body for three days before disposing of it. These alarming actions foreshadowed the unspeakable tragedy that would later unfold, as most serial killers start off by abusing and killing animals before moving over to humans. I paused and he said, why are you doing this? And I said, I've been wanting to do this for a long fucking time, or something. What are you worried about? I mean, this looks like it's pretty close to the road and stuff. Somebody seeing you well, or catching you? it was 11 p.m., okay. so not many were driving by. Well, it was behind the pillar. So people would only see a brief thing here and here. But yeah, but no one stopped. And I'm just like, huh, proves the bystander effect. The bystander effect is a well-known social psychological phenomenon where people are less likely to intervene in emergencies when others are present. Brian's suggestion that society is cold-hearted, implying that no one would have helped his victim, Warren Barnes, only adds to the disturbing nature of his confession. Ironically, in the next sentence, he proceeds to describe in chilling detail how he gruesomely chopped his victim into pieces. This contrast between his judgment of society and the horrifying brutality he inflicted on another human reveals a deeply disturbed and detached mindset. And then I cut off his hands. I put those in plastic Ziploc bags. And then I cut off his right arm at this joint okay. and at this joint. And then at this arm, I tried cutting it here, and then I tried cutting it here, but... What happened was, uh, I accidentally broke his bone, and then I took the head, put it in a leftover pizza box from the dinner a few nights ago, and then I took the hands, put them in the back, drove home, hid the hands and head in my room, cleaned the knife, threw away the garbage with, with the blood on it, and then I tried going to sleep, but I was worried that because there was a hole in my gloves right here, I was worried that they would be able to obtain a partial print. Mm -hmm. So I figured, why not go all the way? After getting back home and cleaning up after the murder, Brian noticed a hole in one of his gloves that could potentially link back to him. To eliminate DNA traces and cover his tracks, he came up with the idea of disposing the body in a lake. But it turned out to be a grave mistake that quickly drew his mother and the police into the crime scene. I drove back in a different outfit, picked up his body, um, put it in my trunk, and drove to the Blue Heron drop-off station. The ramp is quite steep, and you need to have four-wheel drive to uh, pull out of it. Okay. And uh, my car did it. I put it in reverse, A, so that it's easier to pull the body out, and B, because the back tires would provide the polishing to push up. Right. And I open the trunk, I take his body out, I put it in the water, so I just try moving it with my shoes. Um, that works successfully. He goes out some part in the river and floats off. Then when I tried to inevitably try it out, yeah. my car didn't come out. From Blue Heron. Yeah, from Blue Heron. Yeah. My car was stuck. And so then I tried putting it in low gear. 
I'm trying everything at this point. Right, right. And it still doesn't come out. And then it slides into the river. Oh! My car slides into the river, the inside. It is the middle of February. It's cold. At night. Yeah. In the river that's almost freezing. Yes. I'm drenched. <laughs> I almost died. So I'm able to climb out. And I'm sitting there, I need to act fast or else I'll die of hypothermia. I'm, a, yeah. I'm panicking a bit at this point. I'm going to be like, this is what I'm going to remember for dying of hypothermia and a botched attempt at hiding a body. And I'm just like, fuck, fuck, fuck. So I'm running, so I go up the road and I'm trying to slide down the car. One doesn't come by for five minutes. Eventually it does. And it was an old high school friend. By coincidence, a car driven by Brian's old high school friend happened to stop nearby. Brian used his friend's phone to call his mother, fabricating a story about going out late at night to clear his mind. He claimed that his car slid into Lake Blue Heron because he had parked too low. This explanation led to the police being called to the scene, initially thinking it was just a typical teenage car accident. However, as they investigated further and towed the car away, they began to sense that something was off. Hi. Did he say hi to me? Yeah. Hi. Just saying hi. Yep. How do we call a tow for that? I don't know, because he'd have to get in the friggin' water. Yeah. I've never seen a car in the water, but... Not gonna lie, this is my first time, too. Really? It's <laughs> a new one for me. <laughs> What's that? So I've never seen one of these either, so it's a new one for me. I'm like, oh man. What immediately caught the police's attention is the blood from the body was on the reverse bumper. See, I forgot to wipe it off. Oh. And I was so panicked that I wasn't thinking. And so when they pull it out, they immediately see blood on the bumper. They notice more blood on the door handle, the other door handle, passenger one. Did the cops from the police department, did they talk to you about that this morning? No, I was not contacted. Oh. All they were gonna, all they were planning to do with me today is have get my insurance information. Sure. A few days after the incident with the car and the subsequent discovery of the blood that Brian could not explain, body parts of Warren Barnes were found under the bridge near Crosby Avenue, marking a crucial turning point in the investigation, with Brian becoming the main suspect. It's right here. Oh, you see it? Yeah. Because there's an arm. Oh, shit! <laughs> hey. Oh, there's an arm. There's an arm, there's another arm. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's do some pictures. There's another one. Right, here's a leg. Well, there's three. There, there, and there. On that same day, friends of Warren Barnes, concerned for his safety, were questioned about the circumstances of his disappearance. It is shocking that they were questioned just hours after the discovery of the body parts found under the bridge. Uh, we're trying to find out where there's like little apartments that would be super cheap because he works for um, a company that does just like temp agency and they were the ones that actually contacted me because he's never missed work and they know that he sits behind my shop. So I... Um, when was the last time you saw him? Saturday, 5 o'clock. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, Warren, and he was like, okay, meaning he planned on coming down on Sunday, and then he did not show up. He so did. every morning is around 6. Yeah. yeah. Without like, fail. Yeah. Without fail. Seven days a week? Yes. Yeah. He is there every morning. All by himself? Yeah. yeah. And he's the nicest guy ever. Rough, rough looking, but he is the nicest guy.
I was planning to buy an empty paint bucket, put the head in it, seal it, and then I was going to throw it off in some ditch. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I have it right. The head is inside of a trash bag. It was. Well, where is it now? In the kitchen sink. My parents searched through my room and they found the head and hands. The fact that Brian Cohey kept body parts of his victim and stored them in the family home is truly shocking and disturbing. One can only imagine the shock and disbelief that his parents must have experienced when they discovered limbs and a dismembered head in Brian's room. Despite his troubled past, this act was beyond extreme, and it eventually led to the arrest and subsequent interrogation of him. You know, Brian, I have to ask, a lot of people that we have talked with, um, they're you know, silent. Well, or they're just not as well spoken as you are, to be honest with you. You're very articulate. You're very articulate. Nothing I'm bad with words. It is fascinating to observe an interrogation where the suspect not only willingly admits to the crime, but also seems to derive pleasure from confessing every detail. In some instances, socially awkward individuals experience an unexpected surge of confidence, freely sharing their thoughts and providing intricate information with an unusual sense of assurance. This pattern resonates with Brian's somewhat awkward and introverted personality, suggesting that this interrogation might be the first time he feels comfortable expressing himself to people who not only listen, but also display genuine interest in his words. So before this guy, how close have you come in the past? Not at all. Not at all? You just drive around? And yeah, look, just try and find you think anybody interesting? And no. In your mind thought of a plan? Or? Well, occasionally when you see girls walking down the street, uh, I take a glance at them, because... Uh, yeah. It really is like Ed Kemper, where half of me says, well, I'm, I'm quite inept with women. I'm being honest. I'm no Casanova. But half of me says, I want to take that girl home and make her feel nice. And the other half of me, just like what Ed said, is I want to see what her head looks like on a stick. It is unsettling to comprehend that individuals with such disturbing thoughts exist within society. The prevention of Warren Barnes's murder is a complex matter, and we can never be certain of what could have stopped it from happening. Ultimately, it appears to be the result of an egotistical and deeply evil mind. Brian's curiosity about the sensation of taking someone's life was so intense that he was willing to commit this heinous act, knowing it could lead to a lifetime behind bars, all for an experience lasting mere seconds. Such acts challenge our understanding of human nature and the lengths to which some individuals are driven by dark and disturbing impulses. And when did you start thinking about killing people? Six months ago. So, how old are you? I turned 19 last month. So when... Thinking January, back, two months ago. Okay. Thinking back, it sounds like you killed a cat. Well, was actually, I was thinking of killing people during the cat, but I wasn't acting on it. Um, but I started seriously thinking about killing people a year ago. How about when you were 12? Did you think about killing no. people? No. So what in your life has changed or what in your mind has changed? I don't know. Years before the murder, Brian's urge to kill people gradually intensified, and he would frequently drive around late at night with what he referred to as a kill kit, a box filled with tools and weapons for both murder and torture. His initial plan was to kidnap and torture a prostitute. However, one night when he was caught with the kill kit, he was given an ultimatum by his parents. He had to either dispose of everything or face the risk of having the police called on him, possibly leading to charges of conspiracy. If I go back that night, probably wouldn't have done it. Knowing that, knowing what it felt like, knowing how this will all turn out, I wouldn't have done it. Well, what did you think it was going to feel like? What did you, you know, you said you were curious. What did you think it was going to feel like? I thought it would be the best feeling in the world. Okay. What do we need to know about you that we haven't asked? I was planning to become, I was planning to go into the military. Okay. Planning to go into forensics or nursing and uh, eventually become a, go into law enforcement. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. How come go? How come go to forensics and then to law enforcement? Forensics helps with the law enforcement degree. 
As the case unfolded in court, Brian ironically found himself entangled with the same law enforcement he once aspired to join. Cohey chose to plead not guilty by reason of insanity to all the charges. However, the court allowed little room for debate, and he was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder, along with tampering with a deceased human body and evidence. As a consequence, he received a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. The jury finds Cohey guilty for murder in the first degree, guilty for two counts of tampering with a deceased human body, and guilty for tampering with physical evidence. Um, I would just like to express our family's deep and sincere sympathies to the community and the family of Mr. Barnes. Warren Barnes, affectionately known as the Reading Man of Grand Junction, was widely recognized for his deep passion for books and his selfless nature. Despite being homeless, he left a lasting impression as an exceptionally kind and hard-working individual, supporting himself and politely declining food offered by others. In his honor, a memorial was placed on the very bench where he used to read, forever preserving his memory in the heart of the community.